Hi everyone, I'm Sadika. I'm an undergrad at MIT. I'm doing my internship here at OpenAI. Um, broadly, my internship is about generative modeling. And so what are our generative models? They are models that generate data within some kind of distribution. So for example, if you give your model to train on dogs, then you want your model to generate images of previously unseen dogs. Um, why is this useful? It's not inherently clear from my explanation, but when you're able to generate images of dogs, you hope that your model has learned something more, something more useful about exactly what is in the images of these dogs, and it learns some kind of structure that's important. So there are many applications for these types of models. Um, the first one I'll be talking about is world modeling. Um, and world modeling is useful for sample efficient, generalizable reinforcement learning. Um, so what exactly is world modeling? Well. In our hopes and dreams, we want our agents to first learn basic movements. So for example, when you're learning how to walk, you learn how to put one foot in front of the other, then you learn how to turn directions without falling, and maybe even go backwards. Um, once you learn these basic movements, you no longer need specific instructions on how to get from the couch to the TV or from your house to school, because now you have a sense for how basic movements cause interactions in your world. And so the idea is if we can train our agents this way, then hopefully they're able to do more complex tasks that they haven't necessarily been trained to do. And we can train them a lot easier using transfer. So we want to use less data to train our agents because it's expensive to collect this data from our games. That's specifically like episodes and things like that. Um, so in this example here, I have a basic game called car racing. And so in this game, as you can imagine, when you're learning how to drive a car, you learn how to go forward faster, how to slow down, how to turn. Um, and so you can see in the video that the car is able to go on this track. And it's never actually seen this track before. And so it's learning how to turn. And when it messes up, it's able to recover because it knows exactly how its, its movements will interact with its environment. And so this is why model-based reinforcement learning agents would be really cool. And these are our hopes and dreams for them. But alas, there are some shortcomings. So first of all, a lot of the implementations out there right now for model-based reinforcement learning are game-specific. Um, they're also difficult to train, kind of finicky. And one of the biggest problems is that if you have a small artifact when you generate a frame of a game, when you keep rolling out and trying different actions within that particular world model, you're just going to build up on your artifacts. You're never going to be able to fix that and correct for it. And so these small errors can propagate really quickly and cause a lot of problems when you're rolling out. Um, and obviously, for some number of these reasons, we're not able to get model-based agents to do as well as model-free agents. So in the example I show on the right, I'm showing the same exact model that trained the car racing video. But now you can see in the ground, this is a game of Pong. You have two paddles and a ball. You want to keep the ball in play. But when you reconstruct after encoding it, you, you no longer see the ball. You no longer see the other paddle. And so what I mean by reconstruction, I'll explain in a second. But key part here is that you're not able to see the important parts of the game. So you're not, you don't know where the ball is. And so it's hard for the model to learn. So how exactly was that car racing video trained? Um, well, you take a frame and you run it through a variational autoencoder. So you run a series of convolutions to get some latents, which I represent with Z here. And then you run a series of deconvolutions to get a reconstruction of your frame. And you compare that reconstruction to the original frame in order to get some kind of error that you train with. You also give these latents, which you hope provide some kind of context of time-dependent state in your game, to an RNN. And your RNN is going to keep track of things like where are you in the game? How far are your obstacles? What exactly is your specific game state? Um, so the key here is that you don't want your latents to be wasted in encoding something that's true of all game states. So for example, if you're running through a grassy meadow, you don't want your latents to only be encoding grassy meadow. You want them to encode something like, oh, there is a rock there that I could trip on, or something like that. So in this video that I show, it's again the car racing game. On the left, you can see a video of the ground truth. And on the right, you can see what the model actually reconstructs. You can see it's pretty accurate. It doesn't have those red bumpers, which aren't really that important. But the key part here to notice is why this worked on car racing and not on Pong is because there's so few elements in car racing. There's only the track, and then there's this green highway. So if you can roughly model those, you're able to train your agent pretty well. But it's not generalizable to more complex games or games where you have multiple scales of components. So how do we seek to improve this? Well, 
when we pair our VAE or our encoder with a strong decoder, then our latents are forced to mean only things that are dependent on the time, which is what we want. So for example, in this case, when we use a pixel CNN and we condition our pixel CNN on the time state of our game, then we're able to force our latents to just be something like, oh, there is an obstacle at x, y. What does that obstacle look like? Well, that's for the pixel CNN to generate. And so by doing this, we're able to create a more robust model of exactly how we learn and how we think, because I know that I could trip over this table, but I also know I could trip over that couch. And the details of what I'm tripping over aren't that important. It's just that I shouldn't trip. So we also know that pixel CNNs can generate really high resolution images. And so we hope that they can generalize to games that look a lot richer than just the car racing game or the Pong game even. So this is the work that I've been doing with world modeling. Um, now I'm going to transition to talking about how I've been using generative models in the context of invertible flow models. Um, invertible flow models are known for being expressive models with efficient sampling. Um, before I talk about the architecture, I'll show exactly what I mean when something's expressive. Um, so this is a video of my friend Prafala, who I didn't know was going to be here, but he's here. Um, and basically, <laughs> basically, what you can see here is Profila's face morphing into different celebrities' faces. Now, why is this impressive? Because in order for our eye to look at that and say, wow, that's a realistic morphing, every single one of the images that's generated on the way there has to look like a, like a person's face. If something looks grotesquely wrong, we will notice it right away. And so what this is telling us is that when you use an invertible flow model, you learn the latent space so richly that you can interpolate between encodings of different images and still have a reasonable interpolation. So in my mind, if I were to imagine Profila becoming Neil deGrasse Tyson, this is how I would imagine it. So <laughs> but I don't do that often. Um, <laughs> so what do we hope? What are our expectations of flow-based generative models? Well, what we want to do is take some random noise, as you can see in the image on the far right. You take some noise that's sampled based on some prior, usually with a tractable density. And then you warp that via your model into what you want to see. So maybe it's faces, maybe it's cats and dogs. Um, so basically what these equations are saying is you sample a z from your prior, and then you run that z through your invertible network in order to get basically a generated output. So now f needs to be invertible. Our model needs to be invertible. And we can use the statistical change of parameters formula in order to write exactly how the log likelihood of the input can be expressed in terms of this model. And so when we do generative modeling, we always want to maximize the likelihood of generating whatever input we get, because that's our best bet at making something realistic. Um, here what you have is you see that that likelihood can be modeled as the likelihood of generating whatever that random noise is per some prior, minus the log determinant of the, transportation, the transformation between the latents and the inputs. Realities, though. Um, it takes a lot of effort to design a fully invertible model. There are very specific components that can be used, and each of those components tends not to be very expressive. So when you, have, when you want to build an actual model that's able to turn noise into faces, you need to use an extremely large model, which requires a lot of memory. And so as you can see, I have placed this meme here to demonstrate my frustrations in which you build a large model and you want it to be tractable, but no matter how much memory you have, you always run out of memory. Um, yeah, so the types of transformations you can do are things like affine transformations or one by one convolutions. And I can talk more about that when I talk about the specific architecture. So the first flow model was called real MVP. And on top of that, people at OpenAI have refined it to make what's called Glow. Um, there aren't that many differences between the two. But the basic idea is you take an input and you have a multi-scale architecture, which means that because you're only able to do one by one convolutions, you're only able to pick up features at a particular scale. So you need to warp your inputs and reshape them so that you can pick up features on different scales. And so you squeeze, which means you just change the dimensions. And then you go through a step of flow, which is shown on the left. And then the step of flow is just a simple normalization, convolution. And then there's a coupling layer where you split again, and you run half of it through a deep network, and you, run the, and you just let the other half go through. 
This steep network here in the coupling layer is what takes up the most memory in our flow models. So when I sought to work with these models, I shared the parameters across the coupling layers, across all of the different steps of flow. And you would think that, well, that's a lot of parameters that you're losing. That's probably like one out of every 32 um, flow steps is going to be actually expressive. But what I found was you can generate very realistic looking samples and match the bits per dimension using 3% of the memory that you did before and it goes 33% faster in terms of wall clock time. Um, and so these are just CIFAR 10 samples. Um, and as you can see on both sides, they're pretty realistic. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, Will is going to be coming up here to talk a bit about the work we've been doing together on improving flow models in other ways. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hi, very good work. Um, quick question on the VAE architecture. I saw that you had like the, the framework going also directly to the B2C and then. Yeah. Could you like give some insight on that? Yeah, so in our new architecture, we only encode. So we only go from the inputs to the latents. Um, and then we use the latents as a conditioning vector for the pixel CNN. So the raw input also goes to the pixel CNN. And that's why what comes out of the pixel CNN is what you actually train in comparison to the true inputs. Did that kind of make sense? Are there any other questions? Yeah, cool. So I was wondering with relation to invertible models, like are there any, it seems like they're very useful for generative stuff, but it also seems like there could potentially be like, if you can, invert every layer into the neural network and so like train well, is there like any other fields that they'd be good for? Um, so there are actually some troubles that come with invertible models. So the biggest um, pro of using an invertible model is that you can sample really efficiently. So to draw random noise is easy and then to run it backwards through the model is also easy. Um, however, because you are constrained by having these invertible components, you're forced to have a different level of expressivity, and these can also be finicky to train because you can go into regions where it's no longer invertible, or you force, you're like forcing it to be invertible, and it's not able to express what it needs to. Um, and this is part of what my work with Will has been addressing. Okay.